right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for joining us with this live stream uh, with our authors this evening. My name is McKaylee. I'm a Tatter Cover Bookstore. And first and foremost, I want to thank you guys for being here. This is a huge deal for us that we're able to have these virtual events. And the reason that we're able to do it is because of you. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we are very excited to be around for the pandemic, <laughs> you know, there's been a lot going on in our world right now, unfortunately, and but and normally our bookstore is known as a communal space here in Denver. And unfortunately, we're not able to be together right now, maybe very soon with a lot of exciting news that's going on in the world. Uh, lots of hope that's coming in. But right now we've created this virtual community. And so we're grateful to have you here as a part of that. So thank you for being here. For those who are joining us that may not know, Tattered Cover Bookstore is a local independent bookstore in Denver, Colorado. We have four locations in the Denver metro area and right now all of those stores are open. You can come in and visit us as long as you're wearing your mask over your mouth and your nose and you can come visit for about 90 minutes or so, browse the books, smell the books, <laughs> enjoy the environment there. But if you're like me and want to shop in your PJs or you're just not quite ready to go back out yet, totally fine. We got you covered at tattercover.com. Our website's open 24 seven and you can get all of your bookish needs online and still shop locally and support your local community and your local indie. So thank you for doing that. I want to let you know that the books uh, that we're talking about tonight, Himalaya and Bear's Ears, are also available online and in store, uh, online at tattercover.com or at any one of our four locations in the Denver metro area. I also, before we begin, want to let you know that closed captioning is enabled for those who might need it. There's a black bar down at the bottom of your screen with a button labeled CC on it. Click that button and closed captioning is enabled should you want it or need it. Also, we have so many events coming up, it is crazy. We've got two alone tomorrow, one at five o'clock with CJ Box presenting his new Joe Pickett novel, Dark Sky. And we have Joe Ide later that afternoon at 6.30. Um, and that's, two, that's Thursday, March 4th. Joe Ide's newest book, Smoke. We're gonna be talking to him about that. But you can always see what we've got up and coming at tattercover.com slash event. Register online and you can come join us for a plethora of events that we have up and coming here. But the event that we have tonight is fascinating. These are two gentlemen who have known each other for a while and have such a, an interesting, beautiful perspective on the world. There are two books actually have been listed as Tattered Cover's own nonfiction books of the month. Himalaya by Ed Douglas was our January pick in 2021. And believe it or not, David Roberts is gonna be April. His book, Bear's Ears, is our April pick of nonfiction book of the month. Now here's a little bit about our authors this evening. Ed Douglas is an award-winning writer with a passion for the Himalaya, author of a dozen books, including a biography of Tenzing Norgay. He has reported from the region for more than 25 years, covering the Maoist insurgency in Nepal and the Tibetan occupation. He currently lives in Yorkshire, England. And David Roberts, he's a climber and a mountaineer and the author of 30 books about mountaineering, exploration, and anthropology. His books have won the Boardman Tasker Award for Mountain Literature, the Grand Prize at the Banff Mountain Book Festival, and been shortlisted for the Penn slash ESPN Award for Literary Sports Writing. He lives in Massachusetts. And we wanna thank both these gentlemen for joining us this evening. It's my pleasure to welcome Ed Douglas and David Roberts. And I'm gonna have them turn on their cameras and microphones here. So we can get started. Hi, David. There we go. David, it looks like you're still muted. Do you have the button there? That's okay. <laughs> Down in the bottom left hand corner, there's a microphone with a button on it and you can click that and we should be able to hear you. Hi Ed, it's good to see you. Hi, how are you? Great. <laughs> okay. And there he is. Hello, David. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for joining us. And um a special extra thing special thank you to Ed where it's very, very late his time. So thank you for accommodating our mountain states over here. <laughs> oh you're welcome. It's a great pleasure to talk to David anyway. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to let you two gentlemen take it away. I want to let our viewers know that there is a chat 
uh, that some of you already have been active in that's right next to the video you're watching us on. You can chat in uh, that box for questions for our Q&A later um, when the gentlemen are done talking to each other. I'll pop back in and we'll do a Q&A. But for now, the stage is yours, David and Ed. Ed, it's good to see you. I don't think we've uh, seen each other in person since Banff, maybe what, six or eight years ago. Just before you got ill, I think, yeah. 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 But, uh, You've been through the mill since then, huh? That same year you interviewed me at Shelfield, and uh, that was one of the best jobs of being interviewed I've ever had, even though you meant <laughs> Embarrass me three or four times. <laughs> Thank you. You had your daggers <laughs> ready to go. Anyway, it's great to see you again. Um, I, I'm in awe that you have uh, completed, I mean, not just completed this one book. You've, you're now on your third book, I think, since 2015, and you got your diagnosis. Yeah. Um, but this one was clearly a labor of love. I mean, I, I hope all the audience understand what your book is about. If they don't, it's a celebration of the Bears Ears, this astonishing landscape, uh, which was uh, created as a national monument by President Obama in 2016 and then defenestrated uh, a year later <laughs> by President Trump. Right. Um, it is clearly somewhere that, that, that means a great deal to you. Um, you said once that uh, it was the landscape you'd take if you could only have one more landscape to visit. And um, I wondered, you know, in the context of you being very ill, um, you know, whether, whether that landscape became a kind of uh, an encouragement to you in a way to get through it and to get yeah, back. Absolutely. I, uh, I've been out there, the Bears in southeast Utah, uh, a huge tract of land that canyons, mesas, but mainly prehistoric ruins and rock art, the best place in America to see them unrestored. And I've gone out there every year, several times a year for 28 years until 2020 when the COVID hit me in Massachusetts mm. and it just killed me. I planned two trips out there, but of course nobody's going anywhere during the pandemic. But we're planning now to try to get out there this May. And really that's a single event I'm most looking forward to in the next half year or so. What is it about that? I mean, you started off really in love with Alaska, I would I would suggest to you, and then you switched, and maybe we'll talk about how you switched later, but what is it about that landscape that has captivated you? Because you've seen quite a few in your lifetime, huh? Well, you know, I sort of got burned out on Alaska. I climbed there for 15 years and climbed hard for 20 years. You know, you and I are both serious climbers. We were younger. For you, it was the Himalaya. For me, it was Alaska. But, you know, I think too many close calls, too much suffering, too many nights with the tent blowing down and, and the storms coming in, wondering whether you're going to get avalanched, uh, turns you to something a little gentler. But I, I, when I sort of tailed off climbing, I couldn't find that other place or thing for about five or 10 years and then sort of stumbled on this part of Southeast Utah on a magazine assignment. And as you know, you usually do a magazine story and then you go on to something else. But this really got under my skin. And what really got me was the idea that there are ruins from the, what we used to call the Anasazi, the, the uh, prehistoric, Pueblo ones who banished the whole area about 1300 AD. But the ruins in rock art are absolute and pristine condition. And some of them are very hard to find. And a few of them I suspect that I and a few of my friends were the first to visit since 1300 AD. And, you know, the Anasazi were great climbers too. 
And of course, that is part of the appeal. I wonder whether your experience as a climber gave you a perspective um, maybe that some archaeologists lacked. And, yeah, no uh, kidding. The, the archaeologists don't get it. Uh, I found a, dozens of granaries that are like 100 feet up a vertical sandstone wall with no crack systems, no, no obvious way to get to them. And those guys not only got there, but they, they built little mortared granaries there. They hauled corn, beans, and squash up there. They, they visited regularly to retrieve their goods and deposit them. How did they do it? I'm, I mean, it's unfathomable. Because archaeologists don't tend to be climbers, they have minimized the whole phenomenon. I was just wondering, Ed, have you ever been out there, anywhere near there? I have. I've been down to the Four Corners. Yeah, I have. And um, it, it, I was really taken by it. And it really struck, it reminded me of um, places that I'd seen in Mali in West Africa, where oh, yeah. essentially uh, people did the same thing. Um, they, they became, um, and in fact, in Mali, uh, climbing actually was a kind of, it, it, it was a way of um, proving your manhood. So you've, and, been uh, on the, you've been on the Bandiagara. I've been to Bandiagara and I went to a place called the Hand of Fatima in, in, yeah. in Mali, uh, where they found the first, first people to climb up there who did a route of, the easiest way up it is Alpine TD. Yes. No, I've when been there too. The top, yeah. When they got to the top, they found pot shards on it's the summit. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I've been there too and wrote about it for National Geographic. Right. Right, so so it is astonishing what, what people will do, um, yeah. and I wondered whether you speculated why they did it. What was it that made these people live in this place for a couple of centuries or three centuries? Is that right? And then abandon mm -hmm. it. What was this? What's the story there from your perspective? Well, I think in both the the Dogon in Mali and the what I call the Anasazi in Utah. Climbing wasn't about getting to the top. It's one, the biggest difference between them and us. You know, you and I climbed to get to the summit. For them, climbing was a pragmatic thing to, uh, to hide your precious food or to build in a place where bad guys couldn't get to you or even in Mali to, to uh, get to the the pigeon dung, which made the best fertilizer possible. But simply, it didn't quite explain the virtuoso, mm. virtuoso uh, skill of it, like the hand of Fatima, that those prehistoric roots are, you, you really sense there's some sort of, something we can relate to, uh, some kind of aesthetic drive that says, man, I'm going to put up the best fruit anybody seen in the Bandera <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. two generations ago. Well, I, there's it's quite cool a, a, there's a bit of a competitive streak in you, I think. Um, <laughs> just a bit. <laughs> and and so not I, in you? <laughs> no, no, not at all. So, um, <laughs> so I, think, I think you're right about that. I think as soon as you do anything, you know, for very practical, mundane reasons, at some level, you kind of want to get better at it. And out of that comes perhaps, you know, passions for doing things that may not make perfect sense, like mountaineering. Right. Um, you know, I, I, let, let me say something about Himalaya, because it's a truly impressive book. It, it really is your magnum opus. And I was impressed by how, how, modest you are, how, how little there is of you in it, uh, and how much, therefore, of history, people, people we've never heard about, and you really sub, sub, subsume the climbing to the cultural history and the international politics going on there, which is something that most climbers have completely ignored. But, I mean, God, the the work you did, the insight, the, the years of 
research and pondering the places you've been. I don't think there's another book like it. It's very impressive. Well, it's kind of you to say so. I mean, I wrote it because when I went there first, uh, well, almost 30 years ago now, you know, same as you, I think, when you go, when you discover something new, you want to read about it. And what I wanted was a one volume introduction to the Himalaya. And there wasn't one, basically, for the kind of thing that I wanted. And 30 years later, there still wasn't one. So <laughs> <laughs> that's why I did it. But I, I was amazed reading your book, which I love, actually. I really enjoyed it. I have to say, I, I'm just deeply impressed that um, you write so vivaciously. Um, you know, I mean, you, you've got things on your mind and, and, and yet you're still, your mind is still, you know, as, as sharp as ever. Um, but I was really struck by some of the similarities. I mean, just one example, this tremendous distrust of nomads that the civilized <laughs> world has, but in Tibet, it's, you know, China has this deep distrust of nomads, um, arguably for very good reasons, given the damage they, the Mongols did to Beijing, but, um, you know, they're settling Tibetans as fast as they can. You know, stripping them off the land that means so much to them. And um, the Spanish and Anglo-Americans did something very similar to the N Native Americans. Uh, under wow, that's really interesting. Yeah. It's truly interesting because the Spanish is especially discriminated between sedentary Indians who might be saved and might actually have souls and the nomads who were the Indios Barbaros, who were beyond redemption, maybe didn't have souls. I hadn't thought about that. But. As soon as you put, as soon as they put crops in the ground, somehow they were halfway to being right salvageable. <laughs> but what an interesting comparison with the Mongols and the Chinese. Um, I think it's that fear of movement. You know that you you can't you can't tax people, you can't recruit them to your army. You don't know where they are. You don't know what they're about to do. They're not predictable. You can't find them when you need to raise yeah. up an army. They do tend to be more rebellious as well. Hmm. Um, and I'm fascinated by people who would choose, uh, I was trying to remember his name, um, Hayden, um, the Hayden survey. Yeah. Um, Hayden. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it was the Hayden survey. Was it? Drawing this comparison to the hostility of a landscape and the depravity of of a people, um, you know, pe people judging others on the on the nature of the landscape they inhabit. Yeah, in fact, so many of the first American explorers saw the Southwest as not only desolate but incredibly ugly. Uh, the famous Cardenas comment, the first European ever to see the Grand Canyon, about how this was such a, uh, an abominable place. It was completely useless. The Grand Canyon was completely useless and probably would never be visited again. <laughs> and yeah. the guys in Utah, uh, just hated what that most of them hated what they were seeing and considered all those beautiful arches and pinnacles that we we love to walk among today as sort of monstrosities of nature. And then even then and then they again and again they they call the landscape uninhabitable. Even though there were all kinds of Native Americans living there. Mm -hmm. For a thousand years, as far as they could tell, it didn't, exactly. it didn't jibe with the idea of uninhabitable. Yeah, and also uh, such a light touch on the landscape as well, which again is reminds me of Tibet. You know that that people live uh, they kind of it's like a form of geomancy. You know, they really uh, the way that um, dwellings are constructed, the way the landscape is imagined, it's done with immense sensitivity and lightness of touch 
in comparison mm -hmm. to extractive industries and the way I mean, it is astonishing to see nomads put um, taken from their tents on the step and then put in basically, <laughs> I don't know what you'd call it. It's like, it's like a housing estate. We call it in England, you know, a, a subdivision. Is that what you call them in, in, in the States? I don't remember. You know, these little houses and, and they're as baffled as, you know, <laughs> they're just completely baffled by this. Um, the... Um, uh, it, was, yeah, it was just something I wanted to ask you about that. Um, uh, yeah, well, the um, one of the really things that struck me though was um, how this particular monument, you know, this particular designation came about through the work of Native Americans. That's pretty unusual, huh? It's the, it's the first one ever in the U.S. It was actually originally proposed and pushed by Native Americans by the Five Tribe Coalition to the Navajo, two Ute tribes, the Hopi and the Zuni, all of whom had ancestral affiliation to a land that the Mormons would like to think they discovered and owned. And in fact, the, in Utah, you have this quite nasty uh, conflict between the Mormon idea of owning land and possessing and taming it for for the for the Mormon god of for Zion, versus the idea that maybe somebody went there was there before and had a whole different idea what what to do with it. And there was a Navajo leader in particular who has kind of led this um, effort. I wonder if you could tell me a little bit, of, you know, talk a little bit about him because he seems to me a remarkable individual. I'm sorry, who, about whom? Sorry, the Navajo, uh, the Navajo uh, Mark politician. Mer Mark Mary boy, yeah. yeah. He, he, was a, he was a Navajo, grew up right on the edge of the reservation. And um, he said that he, he was inspired by Bobby Kennedy, who came to, when, when Mark was a little kid, Bobby Kennedy was the first guy ever to come on the reservation, first major politician, and talk about saving the land for the natives. And uh, his, Mark wasn't paying any attention. His dad said, you listen, this is, this is really important. You need to pay attention. He's talking about our ancestors. And that stuck with Mark. He ended up becoming a city uh, county councilman. And finally, the first Native American were in Utah. And finally, way back in 2010, got the idea for this monument of the biggest unprotected, well, it was protected, it was federal, but it wasn't was full of uh, depredations, oil and gas leases, pot hunters, so on, of protecting this 1.9 million acres of beautiful wilderness from all exploitation. No park and monument in American history has been started and championed first by Native Americans. And that's what made Trump's destruction of it so much more offensive. It was just a, a complete F you to the natives. Mm. Um, and the other remarkable thing about that, in a way, is that these groups of people uh, a couple of hundred years ago were enemies. Yeah, I mean, that, that's interesting too. The Navajos and Utes used to war against each other. Ayuts against both of them. Even Navajo and Hopi had their disagreements, and um, they've really come together in this inter intertribal coalition. Uh, because, after all, the government is bigger right now than any other tribe. Right now, we have, or we're on the verge of the nomination for Secretary of Interior of a woman named Deb Howland, who is 
from Laguna Pueblo in New Mexico. She would be the first Native American ever appointed to a cabinet post. And the Republicans are tearing her apart because she doesn't believe in fracking. She doesn't believe in letting people take oil wells wherever they want. And I think she's gonna get no, I think she's gonna get confirmed, but she could she could restore the whole monument. And within you know, in a context in the era of climate change, um, <laughs> I think kind of think history is on her side, isn't it? Yeah, of course. My gosh. Yeah. I mean, I did. I was struck about some of that enmity. Uh, just thinking about my own book about how successfully the British um, divide, divided divided um, people who probably had more in common in in facing down the British than than they did against each other, if you see what I mean. And and how uh, American troops kind of arriving in the Southwest did pretty much the same thing. Think well, you know, the, Brit the British, the British in India and, and Tibet and the whole great game, uh, they, they were brilliant imperialists, but so were the Chinese and you really, you see one great virtue of Europe because you see every every different link in that kind of concerted and centuries long oppression in the name of uh, you know civilizing primitive peoples. I mean, a lot of, absolutely, a lot of the language that's used about you know Native Americans in the 19th century and beyond is was used by the British about Tibetans and was uh, used by the Chinese about Tibetans. Same right. thing. Seems the Chinese are still doing to the Uyghurs right now. Precisely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, what they don't have, of course, is religion, which was, I think, uh, uh, it, the shoe is on the other foot, I think, in, in Utah because um, of the Mormons, and um, it, I, I absolutely found that section fascinating. You know, this relationship between the Mormons and Native Americans, and I wonder if you could tell um, the audience a little bit about the doctrine of Lamanites. Is that right? Uh, yeah, the Lamanites. Uh, Lamanites. That's it. Sorry. All Mormon names have Lamanites. Yeah. Have broad uh, vowels. <laughs> uh, the, the, lay, the doctrine of the Lamanites, which was laid down by Joseph Smith in the Book of Mormon, was that there were two tribes that came over from what we now call Israel in, I think, 600 BC. And there were the Lamanites and the Nephites. And the Nephites were the good guys and the Lamanites were the bad guys. And they, they fought, fought against each other. The Lamanites wiped out the Nephites, and in, in punishment for that, God cursed them with dark skin. So they became the Indians. And Smith and Mormon's Mormon uh, theocracy explicitly equates the Lamanites with Native Americans. And in the most insulting passage of all. They're, they're not completely beyond the pale, but if they live a virtuous life, convert to the gospel of the Church of Jesus of this Latter-day Saints, in the next life they can be blessed with, they can become, quote, a white and delightsome people. They can actually have their dark skin turned white and occupy a second niche in heaven. Mm. What more racist drama is there in any world religion? Uh, yeah, no, it, it is, it's absolutely startling actually, and uh, fascinating also, I mean, just politically, because they were operating kind of outside the, uh, I mean, when they, they set up, they were, they were in, they were still part of Mexico, right? It was still part of, um, it, it was outside the yeah. jurisdiction of, of, of DC, right? Yeah, when Brigham Young went to 
under the new Zion in Salt Lake City. It was Mexican territory. He was invading a foreign country. Yeah. Just this notion of a huge expanse. I mean, I, I was staggered at the size of this. I mean, it's four times. I mean, I'm sitting on the edge of our oldest national park. And um, Bears Ears is four times the size of it. <laughs> what is your oldest national park? I'm the just... Peak District. Oh, right, of course. Um, is that only a fourth as big? Yeah. Yeah. It's the same, it's roughly the same size as um, the favorite, put your favorite part of Bears Ears. Um, Cedar Mesa. Uh, yeah, Cedar Mesa. It's roughly the same size. Huh, as that. Interesting. I <laughs> uh, I haven't been in the Peak, Peak District in decades, but I'd love to get back there. Um, but it, it, it's, um, it's very interesting because dif different views of national parks, because yeah. you know, your national parks are, are, are nature-based, uh, ours are more about human heritage. Mm -hmm. In fact, the IUCN had to more or less create a new designation of national parks in order to get Britain in, because our, our landscape yeah. is so nature-depleted that um, mm -hmm. you know, no American would recognize our national park as a national park, partly because they're for the people. I mean, they're... <laughs> That's fascinating to just hear the difference between the two countries and the national park there. Yeah, I, yeah. I feel like we could let you two go on for another hour or two, you know, but I, I we have eager people waiting for Q&A here. And, of course. Uh, and I, I want to thank you both because this conversation was very natural and interesting between the two of you. And I like the fact that you know, you brought up your expertise in, in multiple ways. So thank you for that. Um, we have we have questions now for audience q and A. If you have questions for Ed or David about their books, what they've studied, places they've been, uh, you can do that in the chat that's next to the video that you're watching us on right now. Um, and speaking of travel, I think this is a really interesting question to start off with of where would you, where do you want to go next once, um, the pandemic allows us to go. <laughs> As being such being such adventurers yourselves, do you do you have a, a travel plan ready to go? Yeah, um, yeah, I do actually. I I was on. I'm going on an expedition uh, to Western Nepal in the autumn. Wow. Uh, before that, I think um, I have a. I've got assignments in Ladakh, in Western, further west. Uh, but that's have, you, have you, Ed, have you been out of England in, in the last year? Uh, my last, no, my last uh, foreign trip was um, was in uh, Switzerland in in February, just as it was starting. And um, just as it was starting, yeah, yeah. And then I had my own health troubles, not with COVID, with something else. But luckily, I got through that. Sorry, yeah. Um, no, ah, nothing. Yeah, nothing compared to your long haul. Um, I haven't. I haven't been out of New England in yeah. and driving me crazy. I mean, of course, I want to get back to Utah, but yeah. I also have a tremendous passion for France, and I planned the trip to the Bourgogne, Burgundy. Yeah, uh, looking mainly at. Romanesque churches, which is another of my oh, yeah. passions. Well, we have family in France. I, I regularly go to Marseille, where my brother-in-law uh, lives, and um, ah. I love Marseille. It's just the yeah. coolest city. And we go a lot. We do, you know, we go climbing in the Calanque and Mont Saint Victoire, and I really miss it. I miss the light. Yeah, if you know what a British winter is like. You don't want to be in it. <laughs> so relentlessly gray. Well, we should meet in France somewhere. Yeah, yeah, we should. When this Although, lets I mean, uh, I, I'm very keen to go back to um, to Utah. Actually, I thought I'm. Um, oh, great! Meet in Utah. Well, you you travelled with um, our mutual friend Greg Child, mm. and um, I'm also know Shannon very well. So I mean, it, it would be great to hook up with uh, those guys. Yeah, uh, Greg is one of my absolute regular. Partners in the in the Bears Ears Monument. I can imagine he'd be really into it. Love the desert. One of the great climbers of our time, too. Absolutely. So, one of the other questions that we have here is about your writing in particular, and what drew you both to writing, being such adventurers. Um, what made you also want to document what you were doing, um, you know, in the form of books. 
I would say actually um, they came very close together and I would say I was probably a writer first. Um, but like David, I started climbing when I was 14, 15, which for a young man is a very dangerous period because like you're trying to, you know, I don't know, come up with a good story. <laughs> and um, I, I was very physical, I was very active, didn't like team sports, a little bit of a loner, um, but I really like stories. And um, like David, I started reading and um, you know some of the great classics of adventure and so on. I thought, yeah, I'd do that, I'd do that. I would love to do that. Well, how about for you, David? How did you get bit by the writing bug? Well, I I sort of wanted to be a writer in my teens, late teens and early twenties. Um, but I wasn't. I was writing short stories and poems in a creative writing class, but they were they were not really close to my heart. But when I was twenty two, I went on my third Alaskan expedition to Mount Huntington. The hardest, the hardest one I'd done. And we had this long, long failure and then success on the 32nd day. And just hours after we all four stood on the summit, my partner, Ed Burns, fell to his death on the descent. And that so shook me up that the whole next year when I was in grad school, working away in the classes, I just couldn't get it out of my head. And I finally decided I needed to write a book about it. I actually wrote the book in nine days. And uh, so suddenly I wrote The Mountain of My Fear, my first published book. And when it got published, I thought, God, this is the way to go. And I haven't really stopped since. So it's taken me a lot longer than nine days to write. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it just got longer after that. Wow, what an incredible start. And thank you for sharing that. That's amazing. I, speaking of writing, this is a really great question. Can each of you speak to capturing the essence of a place in writing? How do you connect with the landscape? David? Or Ed, either one of you. It was a question for both of you. Oh, no, no. Wow. David, I, David is, uh, I think David should answer that first while I desperately try and think of a good answer. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I, I think I'm an intensely verbal, not a very visual person. And when I see something, I... I I think first in terms of words. And then if you're in a, if you suddenly stumble into a place that you think is stunning and beautiful and amazing, those are the words that come to your mind and you realize every one of them is a cliche. And if you wrote a sentence saying, I walked into this stunning, beautiful, amazing place, it would just be head on the page. So that drives you to figure out how to really describe the place and why it's special, why it's different. Uh, and that habit has never gone away from me. I, I dream in words, not in pictures. And uh, you know, I sometimes find myself actually writing first lines of books in my sleep. It's just compulsive. What an incredible talent. That's, wow. How about for you, Ed? I would think, yeah, something similar. I mean, I would also say, I mean, I don't have a visual imagination particularly, but I, um, sensation is really important to me. And um, uh, landscapes are incredibly layered. So, so um, there's obviously a deep human connection. And as soon as you meant to say human, you mean narrative, because that's what we do. But also, uh, per perhaps because of the nature of English landscape, you know, English landscapes, because I'm English. Um, 
the changeability of them is quite staggering because the because the weather is always changing, always changing, and the light is always changing. And so you, if you if you, you have to sort of maintain this level of attentiveness, I'm a big fan of attentiveness, and and that requires time and clearing your mind, and um, calming your head, and just um, just feeling you know that you know the freshness of rain and just just the way the light can be flat as a pancake and then suddenly the clouds will shift and suddenly the, your world is three-dimensional and uh, um so that i think is is really important to me the the feel of like a place on your skin you know tibet is um so utterly different in that regard um you know i can just look at a, at a photograph and know that it's at high altitude because of and you can then suddenly feel how that is different. So that physiological experience of landscape, I think, is uh, very important to me. I'm just in awe. I know I keep using the word wow, and I apologize for my repetitive nature of it. But to me, this is, and both of your books are so incredible in the way that they bring to light these landscapes. And I think that that's something that a lot of people have been craving since they've been stuck in their house or as you said, David going stir crazy in their home, you know, yeah. and it's so visceral and you both have such a talent for that. And I'm in awe of it. So that's why I keep saying, wow. Um, and, and I want to keep talking to both of you, but unfortunately we're hitting, we're getting sure. close on our time here, but we still have time for one more question. And we, and we love asking this question here at Tattered Cover. And because both of you have books that came out recently, it applies really well, but what did this most recent book you wrote teach you? What did you learn from this book? Um, it can be anything and any way you want to answer that, but what did this book teach you? Never write a compendious history again, ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, Ed, it's, your, it's your magnum opus. I know, I'm not doing that again. That's hundreds and hundreds of books I read and um, years and years of um, writing. Um, that's, that's what it, it showed me. You've only got one of those, one of those jobs inside you. Yeah, you only got, then, you only got one. Yeah. But, but at, least, at least you have one. Most of us don't even have one. Very good point. It's a really impressive book. I mean, God, it's, it is 25 years of labor and love. It's beautiful. So good. It's kind of you, but in all honesty, I said this to, um, I did a uh, gig with Ed Caesar, you know, who wrote The, the Moth and the, yeah. The Moth and the Mountain. Guy. He said, how do you feel after doing that? And I said, and uh, without thinking about it, I said, I feel ashamed. Hmm. And I'll tell you why, because he was just floored by, by me saying that. And I don't think he really understood it, but, um, do you know, I was tiptoeing around some formidably brilliant people. And what I had done was to kind of, not cherry pick, but, but condense and refine and, and, and reduce um, some unbelievably complicated, subtle people um, who are great scholars, some of them. And I thought that I, I felt a little bit like, <laughs> uh, you know, I'd repackaged them in, in a way that left me dissatisfied. That's too modest. It, no, not at all. You know, um, it really isn't because, you know, some of the, I became fascinated by um, a group of people known as Nyompa, who are sort of translates as the wild people, who are kind of like spiritual masters who reject all rules and they challenge and um, they live lives often of great austerity, but they also are immensely creative, um, exciting, very exciting people. And um, I just thought some of these people were living a thousand years ago, you know, and, and talking about the human mind with such insight and precision and, and in a way that seems incredibly modern. And, um, and here I am, you know, <laughs> Puttering around in in their wake, trying to you know. So 
it was it was a salutary lesson i mean i'm very pleased i did it i think it's a useful book but um but yeah there was no great sense of celebration when i'd done it without you we wouldn't even know about them that's yes, what i was david you took the words out of my mouth i, I was gonna say the same thing i was like i'm gra i'm grateful for your puttering around as you said because <laughs> i don't think we would have known that they existed david hit the nail on the I've, head there I've read a lot of Himalayan history, and there's so much in there that I'd never heard of. Right. Made me want to, want to learn more. So that's certainly not wasted on me. Good. But me, me one of the me things that I took from both books is um, one of the most harrowing things to look into is the impact of the Cultural Revolution on Tibet. And, um, and there were hints of that, I think, in, uh, your, in your book particularly with, um, uh, I just remember it's now the Bosque Redondo, is that right? Mm, yeah. Marching people, taking them from their landscape, you're basically ripping them out by the roots, putting them in a different soil and not watering them properly. Right. And, then, and then people fade and they wither. And um, that's essentially what was done in Tibet. And... Um, the way that we argue ourselves into inhumanity. We've seen it again in the last four years, not just your government, my government as well. That's, and, well, um, said. Oh. that's, that's well said, Ed, thank you. Mm. David, how about for you? What did you learn well, from, I guess, from Ed's book? <laughs> yeah, well, I could go on and on about what I learned from Ed's book, and I haven't finished reading it yet, so. Um, yeah, I know there's so much more there. I guess in my, my case, what I learned is that people I had always sort of, since I'm writing about the history of the Bears Ears and not just the current controversy, there were all kinds of people I had sort of stereotyped in my mind, like some of the early cattle ranchers as essentially, you know, Cowboys I didn't sympathize with. And then I discover a real character like Al Skorb or Charlie Sheen, who made the biggest finance in uranium money. We, we think uranium money, oh, what a horror. But Charlie Sheen was a real character. And it gave me a certain uh, empathy for people I thought I despised and therefore a whole new way of looking at a landscape even though I'm still firmly pro-monument, pro-Mark Mary Boy and the Andrew Tribal Coalition. Well, empathy is one of the greatest lessons we can learn with that. And I think you do a great job of portraying that in your book as well. Thank you both of you for the gift of these books and for your research and your time and your honesty this evening as well. It's made the event quite special. So thank you both for that. I want to remind audiences that they can get The Bear's Ears by David Roberts and Himalaya, A Human History by Ed Douglas at tattercover.com. Gentlemen, thank you for this evening. And I want to give you a chance to remind people who you are, where they can find you online, anything else you want to say before we end the broadcast tonight. Ed, will you kick us off? Uh, yeah, I'm Ed Douglas. Uh, my new book is Himalaya, uh, Human History, published by Norton and all for, available from all good shop, uh, bookshops, particularly that in Denver, the task of cover. And Ed and I share a subhead. Mine is the Bears here to human history. Mm -hmm. World's most endangered, uh, America's most endangered landscape. But the, the great thing about this show is chatting with Ed again. It's been too long and we always have such great conversations. And this is the kind that would go on into the night with much more scotch if we all knew same place together. I didn't we'll do, my we'll do it again. Absolutely, <laughs> Well, I have good to see you, Ed. Good to see you. Thank you. Yes, and I thank you both um, for such a wonderful conversation and such a wonderful evening. Um, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in tonight. Once again, this is Tattered Cover Bookstore coming to you with celebrating the release of The Bear's Ears and celebrating Himalaya a Human History, both of which you can buy at tatterdcover.com. Gentlemen, if you'll stay on the line while I finish up here, uh, we want to thank you guys again for shopping locally. We have plenty more events coming up. 
uh, this week and the rest of the month and into the summer. So you can check that out at tatteredcover.com slash event. And uh, you guys are a wonderful community. We're lucky to be a part of it. So thank you guys again and stay safe, everybody. Happy reading. Bye all. <laughs>